Right guys, I'd like to say a massive thank you so much to all my subscribers that have helped me out on GoFundMe and also um, through my PayPal account as well. We've hit a nice little target now and I've managed to get this lovely little cordless drill which is fantastic. It's got a nice little 18 volt battery there, 4 amp power and that is going to keep me whizzing away and building and creating things. We've also got a nice little box here full of multi drill bits, drill heads, all that kind of stuff, spare battery and a nice charger as well so we're on the way there guys couldn't thank you enough really do appreciate this kindness that you've that you've showed me on my channel right there you go guys we've got the tank all up and running it's filled up with seawater well it's not seawater from the sea around here now one of you guys said that why didn't you just use the seawater around where you live? Now the reason for that is, is we're like on an estuary in the Bristol Channel. So it's very muddy, the water, not very nice. A lot of, you know, debris in the water and stuff like that, probably diesel. It's not like it's crystal clear water, like it's further up, further up the coast, um, Tembe Way and places like that past Swansea. It clears up a little bit back there, but where we are, it's a little bit too murky up that way. And I'm not really a fan of that. So I've mixed it up. Um, to 35 parts um, per thousand so um, we've got normal salt water content in there and I've also put in some coral sand as well now it's nice and white it's got a lot of dead and decaying um, bristol worms and things in this and I thought well I had it in a bucket outside because I took it out of one of my tanks and it had various little pests in it and different things which are all going to die off in this water because it's um, it's cold so anything that was in there is going to die and there was lots of little bristle worms there was lots of little sea fleas copepods all that kind of stuff that was living in amongst the the sand which has died off so that's going to start that nitrogen cycle off which it has done already because it was crystal clear when i put it in there i washed it all through with some old sea water um, and i put it in there now if you can see there's swirling bacteria in that water which is the start of the nitrogen cycle now if you've ever given your tank a really good water change maybe 50% or maybe even a little bit more and you find the next couple of days after or two or three days afterwards you're going to get an algae bloom just like this now it's all part of the nitrogen cycle basically what's happening is in this tank is it's a new startup tank so the bacteria has gone mad in there with all the decay and the ammonia in the water it's feeding on that it's blooming but in your tank if you did it in your tropical tank say at home you'd get the same thing but it would clear up quicker because when you take out a lot of water out of your system, you're taking out a lot of that beneficial bacteria as well, okay? And you clean your filters out and things. And what will happen is, is you'll get this algae bloom for a couple of days and then it will clear it up because the colonization of the bacteria will get up to a certain level and it'll clear up for you again. But this is gonna last maybe a week. I'm not too fussed. This is how I like to do things like this with anything marine is nice and slow, take it easy. I don't add any bacterial balls or anything like that. I always chuck a raw shrimp in there or something along those lines um, we got some decent lighting over the top we've got a couple of fluval uh, power bars across the top there I'll just show you those now and a max spec jump light as well they kindly sponsored me a couple of those a while ago these are the fluval ones that I'm using there as you can see I'm being pestered by a mosquito here he doesn't realize he's going for the blue light but he's going to end up going in that seawater and it'll be the end of him and I've got this one up here, which is that Max Spec. Sorry, it's a bit dark. The little Max Spec jump, which is great. It's all controlled via Bluetooth, as are these power bars as well. They're fantastic little lights. I'll show you on my phone now how you can adjust those up and down. All right, there you go, guys. These are the Fluval Evos. Uh, sorry, the power bars. So I just click on one, like so. And it'll connect to the device as you can see there and you've got your sunrise times let me see that there but your sunrise times there you got your daylight your sunset and night setting so basically if i want to just put the daylight i can go into that and you can see everything is flat out but i can move any one of these color bars for the blue and the different color spectrums within and if i press save you'll see the tank the tank change color in the back And now it's changed to a different colour. So you can you can basically change any of the spectrum around. I normally I've got them all on full because I'm cycling this through. I want to get as much light and things into the water, get everything blooming, 
and you just press save and you see that go back to normal fantastic little lights they sponsored me these a while ago now and I've had them in the in my coral room there for some time and they've done a fantastic job but I've got some other lighting in there now I'm not really using it as much in there so I'm just using these and they're fantastic you've got a manual mode auto mode you've got the nights you can have it right the way down you can put your night lights down you can have just a little tiny bit of blue on the bottom there so you can mimic that sunrise sunset with your times really really good little lights I've got mine coming on at seven o'clock in the morning till nine o'clock in the evening when they go off and it will ramp up and ramp back down I'll leave a link to the description in these okay where you can pick these up if you want to go and pick them up it'd be brilliant help me out a little bit as well um, but yes they're the lights I'm using now the max spec because this is out in my workshop it's not reaching my router so there you go so that one I've got to just do manually for the time being but that's no trouble at all now the reason why we've got a lot of light in here and all these lights you may be saying why so many lights it looks like Blackpool illuminations well the reason for that is we want to be growing nice types of microalgae, macroalgae, all the different weeds and things like that which we get in the ocean and they love a lot of light, these little rock pool things like the sea lettuce, the dulse, the different streamer weeds that we get around here. It's going to be some really nice um, stuff that we can put in there for our little creatures and critters to creep around and hide in amongst and feel nice and safe. We'll get some of those on the rocks as well. But this is where it is so far, we're in a bacterial bloom. I'll get you a nice close-up of that and you can see it swirling. If that's focusing enough, you can actually see that swirling away. Look at that. As that pump is blowing it around. And in time, that's going to settle out. It'll create a lot of bacteria in that filter now. It's going to be utilising that ammonia, which is in this, gra in this gravel. All the dead and decaying bits that are in there. One of you guys was asking me about these as well now these are the obviously that's that's the inlet sorry the outlet the inlet for the Oasi um, filter is over there now these are quite handy because you've got you can put a screwdriver in there and you just twist it for maximum minimum maximum flow and they've got one on each side and you can see that one over there as well in that corner but that's what they're for there's the return there but you can see all those bits of decay bits swirling around in there I know it's not the greatest picture guys but uh, just to give you a little a little show there's something down there what's that looks like a bit of weed to me or something but there's all kinds of dead bristle worms floating away there in the current which is fantastic stuff look at that we're on the way guys we're on the way I'm so looking forward to getting down the beach getting the waders on and getting in amongst them rock pools and find some little creepies and stuff like that okay guys there you go we're and in, in my living room now we're going to look around through the little evo now you can see there's been a few changes in here and if you look under the rock right in that little dark hollow underneath that pulse in Xenia, you'll see a bangai cardinal now these are from the island of bangal bangai i should say in indonesia fantastic little starter fish they really are they just hang in the current taking little particles of food, little plankton things as they as they swim past and they'll take quite big baits as well. I normally drop in a couple of shrimps, little um, little bits of shrimp in there for them to eat because I'm, we're going to be breeding these guys in here. Now the fantastic thing about Bangai Cardinal fishes is they're mouth brooders. The male and female come together, they'll lay the eggs in the, and the sperm will mix in the water quick and he'll take those eggs into his mouth and that's where they're going to hatch just like cichlids and um, Jawfish and all the other species that do that as well, mouth brooders and from all over the place, from all over the world, they do the same thing. Let me try and square that up for you a little bit. It's a little bit off square. There you go. Yeah, they'll hold those eggs in the mouth until they're literally mini replicas of the parents. And then what they'll do is they'll go and find somewhere safe, which is normally a sea urchin, a black sea urchin, spiny one. And what they'll do is they'll just go and spit them into the uh, the spikes of the sea urchin. And that is where they'll be protected and they'll follow that little sea urchin around picking off the little bits of plankton and, and the uh, and all the little creepy crawlies that adrift around in the tide and they'll grow slowly and they hang around in little shoals they look fantastic so what we're gonna we'll, we'll be making i'll make a fake 
um, sea urchin later on to show you how I do it. I used to breed a lot of these a few years back and they're beautiful little fish when they come out. So tiny but they're just absolutely miniature versions of the adults with their little flowing fins and that little action, that little twitchy twitchy action there. I'll try and get you a little bit closer in there. We'll try and feed them in a little bit as well. I'll try and put a little bit of shrimp in there so they'll, uh, you'll see them come out and have a go at it. They're very quick. I've only been in there now. I've had these. I picked these up as a pair oh I would say nearly a year ago now and I picked them out as what I thought was a pair and it's turned out they are a pair. The one that you're looking at now is a female. If you can barely see her there in the shadow and the male's further underneath. He's got a lot more blockier, heavier jaw because he takes the eggs and looks after them. Um, and the great thing is, is they're fantastic parents as well. They'll, they'll, they don't eat the babies. They, they'll all hang around in a big shoal, which is fabulous. And if you do notice, I've taken Barney out, which was that little clownfish, as my wife named him, Barney. He's back in the coral room now. He's got a tank all to himself with his anemone because he kept on annoying these guys and taking all his food and taking their food and... It was quite comical, but um, I want to give these guys peace and quiet so they'll breed. And we can show you some of that action in the next few weeks, hopefully. But we've done a lot of changes in here. We've changed out. We've got some lovely big zoanthid colonies in there. We've got some lovely big, nice bubble, tri bubble tip there. And one up in the top there as well, which is split. This, isn't, this has only moved. It's moved from that rock to there in a matter of literally half an hour. Because that's where it's decided it wants to be, by that blue sponge and the chilli coral there which are also new additions. We've also got some plating monty in there as well, some green cabbage, toxic cabbage coral, lots of different zoanthids, beautiful little fan worm right here, sand anemone, big plating monty at the top, and we've also got this nice gagonian as well, which has just decided to shed it's it's um, it's out of skin off. They do that, like toadstool corals and things. You find when you've got a toadstool coral, it will shrink up, and you think there's something wrong with it, but basically what it's doing, it will shrink itself up and it will actually eject the, the, that, ex, that external skin. So if any anything like um, algae and things are growing on it, just like a snake would shed its, shed its skin, and as you can see, it shed it off. You can see all the ribbons there. Oh, just turkey baste that off. Just blow it away and it will just come off and suck it off. And you can see all the little, all the little polyps have come out now, which is fantastic. Look at that. Really happy way this is going. Got my little little hermit crab there, little red leg hermit. He loves running all over the zoanthid colonies and making them all close up and annoying them, or climbing up the side here, up the up the astroturf as I call it, and um, and then falling back down when there's food. We got the turbo snails in there. They were actually breeding a couple of days ago. This I came downstairs and this was absolutely milky white. It looked it looked like the the tank in the in the workshop, the new sea tank in there. It was that milky, and it was just all the all the milk from the uh, from the male turbo snails, which would go right up to the surface and release it in the water. We got all kinds in there: volcanoes, that Priscilla pora, like I said, lots of little multi-different coloured heads. We got some of that toxic green cabbage coral up there. We just go that way a bit. Got some green pallies as well. Nice little bit of algae on the glass there, which he's heading. Mr. Turbo snails heading towards it in hot pursuit of algae. And he'll be on the glass there in no time. There he goes. He's just going up the glass now. My goodness, he made short, short work of that, didn't he? Here you go, guys. I'll give you another little view of that bubble tip anemone there. They're absolutely beautiful. The camera doesn't really do it any justice whatsoever. You've got to get these different filters and with the different lights. Um, it's really difficult to... Uh, to get it as you see it with your own eyes. But um, there's some lovely stuff there. We've got a lovely little chili coral there. We've got a beautiful little blue sp little sponge, which are filter feeders, if you didn't know. They suck that water through that little gate there and through that tissue of the body. We've got to have super clean water, okay, guys, because they the little tiny pores and the structure within them gets blocked up so easily and they'll turn white and they'll die in no time at all if you've got a lot of detritus and fish in your tank and things like that. Partly a lot of fish will eat them as well which isn't good. What else can I show you? Just undo that, we'll twist around this way a bit. We've got some green pallies there. There's that little Bangai Cardinal there, hiding underneath. That's a little female. Beautiful little fish, they really are. Like I said, mouth brooders. 
and I think they make great little nano fish because you can have a pair in there because they don't need a lot of space to whiz about they become very accustomed to their uh, surroundings I think what I'll do now is I'll get a little bit of shrimp and I'll drop it in move this camera back a bit and see if they'll come out and grab some food all right guys here we go fingers crossed they might come out I use tweezers and I just drop it in <laughs> popped out there nearly got it can smell it in the water though boom got it let's see if the male will come out for the other bit if he doesn't who knows he could be holding some eggs because that's when you know that they're uh, when they stop feeding it's normally because they've got a mouthful of eggs that bite that bit might get hooked up somewhere Still swirling around. Oh, here he comes. He was thinking about it. It's going to get blown down by the pump now. Is he going to get it? Boom. Good lad. So he hasn't got eggs in his mouth, but he's feeding well, which is the main thing, because that's the thing with these when you breed them. You've got to make sure that they are very, very healthy and full of fats and things that are going to sustain them, because they're going to be holding onto their eggs for a, few, for a couple of three weeks and um, and what you'll find is if you don't feed them regularly they'll get hungry and they will eat the eggs so that's what you've got to be pretty wary of and make sure you really fatten them up first get them really used to that food I don't think these guys are going to breed as yet I've been feeding them big chunks of prawn like that to, well, I think probably two or three times a day to hopefully bulk them up a bit and then when they feel ready they'll have a little clutch of eggs and they can have up to 40 40 eggs so uh, it's quite a, a big a big cluster of eggs there and when they all come out it's absolutely stunning it really is it's amazing to watch and mix it all up and then it goes through the filter and before you know it you're inundated with little baby turbo snails flying about all over the place so I think what we'll do is we'll go in there we'll have a nice little close-up look at what's been going on I've got some bacilla pora at the back I've added that as well what else have I added in there we've got that rock flower anemone there I've got some more coral coming in today probably this evening so um, I'm not sure what I'll have in there but I always pinch a little bit for myself and put it in here or something that I think could work better in here and zoanthids GSP and all the, the um, pulsing xenia and things are fantastic as well now I absolutely love feather dusters we've got a beautiful one right there only a small one but he's coming on the rock and he's grown there over the few the last few weeks just just came out as a tiny little one and he's grown up and what they'll do is they'll actually that little feather the hat there that you can see that's where they'll collect all the food particles in there then they retract it into this little little sheath they've got which they create out of the sand and detritus within your tank and they'll take all the food particles off of that and then they'll put that little feather duster back out again and go fishing for some more but sometimes you'll find they'll get a little bit a little bit ropey looking, a little bit tatty around the edges and you, sometimes you'll just see it floating around, you'll just see that will just come off and you'll just see it floating around in the tank and you'll wonder what's going on, you'll think that it's died but what they actually do is, um, is they release that the old plume because it's not, up to the, it's not up to speed anymore, it's like an old fishing net with loads of holes in it and all the fish get through same thing for them, they're not working to their best so they'll cast that one off and they'll actually grow a new one so you might not see it for a week or two weeks and you might think oh it's gone, it's died and the next minute you'll see it come out and it'll be lovely and fresh and bright again and you'll have a new a new fan worm in there and it'll come back a bit bigger as well you've got lots of tiny little bits of GSP you see that down there look at that there's little tiny bits right there little bits that have budded off and that fall off and they start a new colony somewhere else some lovely zoas in here some spider-man zoas
Well, I'm glad they gave you that little feeding show. Brilliant stuff. Yeah, the chilli corals are really awesome as well. They look nice and red, just like little cactuses there during the day, but in the evening time they swell up about three or four times that size and you get lovely white little polyps come out all over them and they feed in the evening time in the darkness. Um, but it's beautiful to watch. You come down with a very low power torch and you can shine it in there, put some uh, reef roids in there or whatever type of powdered coral feed that you use and you can watch all the little polyps grabbing bits out of the water column and feeding on it. It's very interesting to watch. There's some of the big Montipora there that I put in there. That's soon going to get stuck to that glass at the back and start putting out various little plates. But with these little nano tanks, guys, if you do put any Montes in any LPS or SPS corals, you've got to keep your levels spot on, okay? Especially your calcium and your cage and all that kind of stuff. It's got to be on point, otherwise these are going to starve of that because they're obviously utilising it out of the water column all the time. So once it gets low... So regular Sunday water tests, guys, okay? Make sure you do them and write everything down in a little book and you'll know where you are. We've got that nice little rock flower anemone there just tucked away in amongst those zoanthids and that Pacillopora at the background as well. Now that's another, obviously, that's an SPS coral which has been engulfed by those zoas but those little growing heads are stuck out. The base will probably die off and the zoas will start taking over that dead skeleton in no time at all. But those little growing heads, they'll soon start growing up into the water column and finding their, finding their way and, and looking great. Got another big colony of zoas at the back there. And if you look amongst the pulse and zini there, you can see another, another bubble tip. Where's my little mate? There he is. He's annoying everybody as usual. Walking around, picking up little bits of detritus. He always get he, he likes it when the bang guys miss a little bit of prawn. He's on it in no time at all. Grabs it and runs away with it. Yep, like I said before on other other videos that I've done on these, they're a fantastic little tank. They really are. Um, the amount you can get in them, you can really make a beautiful little living room tank. Where you can just sit it down on the side by your armchair. You can keep keep watching it and watching it grow over time. It's always it's minimal water changes, sort of like 10% I do on this every two weeks. Obviously, you've got the evaporation side of it as well. If you can get, you can either use distilled water if you like or whatever, or just some RO water if you pick some RO water up from your local shop. Um, keep a five-gallon jack of that. It lasts you for oh, a couple of months at least. Um, just top it up a litre every, you know, every time it drops just down below and it starts pouring out. Just keep your eye on the salinity because obviously... With seawater, when you get that evaporation, the fresh water evaporates away and it leaves the salt behind. The salt doesn't go anywhere in the evaporation. It stays in the water column, okay? So your salinity is going to creep up and up and up as that water just goes down and evaporates away. So you've got to top that back up regularly every week or so as you see it go down an inch. I mark my the side right here. This is where I keep my flipper cleaning gear as well. Those guys sent me that ages ago. That's pretty awesome stuff. I keep that in the filter chamber at the side, you see. Keeps it out of the tank and it keeps it there. But what I do is I wait until that evaporation goes down to about here, about an inch down across there, and it just starts flowing down. And you can just start to hear it trickle over the top. And that's when I top it up. Now, if you notice, I've got a new light. Look at that. It's a Max Spec light. They did send me two of those a long time ago. Here's a bit of the Paladarium, guys. Massive great crack, that was from one side of it. I just did a rough cut across there just to give me a new drip tray. As you can see, the condensation there is being is pretty fierce. And um, the reason for that is because when you take the fire, I found with the fluval, the one thing that you've got to watch is when you're taking the light on and off all the time, maybe cleaning and different things, keep your eye on the wire because my wire broke right in there, right next to it, and there's no way you could get a, a kit on there or solder it back together. So um, Sadly, that light is doomed. So we've got the little max spec one on there. So we've got a better light spectrum, as you can see, down in the tank. We can play around with that as much as we like, because this is indoors, and I can pick up my Wi-Fi inside, and I can play around with all the different settings. But uh, I think the tank's looking great. We can always fit more in there. There's always room to put more in a little tank. Little frags here and there, get them growing. But yep. Yeah. That'll do for now until I get some more Perspex cut and then I'll make a new a new tray then that will cover the complete top 
and I'll drill a few little holes just for some ventilation to go on there. Yeah, when that paludarium went, that was a real, real shock. It really was. And it was only a, literally a golf ball size pebble that I dropped. And where um, old Spook the Fahaka puffer fish was sleeping, he'd wafted all the sand away, all that river sand. So it was bare glass and I dropped it. And because I dropped the water level as well, just pinged on the bottom and just bang, huge crack right the way across. Um, if I was using bigger bigger rocks and stuff in there what I would have done like I normally do is put some egg crate in there or something just to support them but these were only tiny little pebbles but uh, even after all the years I've been in this game you still um, you still have little accidents now and again or you just forget about something and something happens but that's just just the way it goes it happens to us all once and once in a while and if it hasn't happened to you you're lucky that's what anyway guys as always, you're all stars. Thank you for subscribing to the channel. Thank you for being part of Mark's Aquatics. Massive thank yous again for helping me out in the workshop with those donations that you put through PayPal. Like I said, if you wanted to fund me in any way, shape or form, I really do appreciate it. It all helps a little bit. Um, I've got that GoFundMe page under Mark's Aquatics. If you ever want to give anything, it'd be more than welcome. It really would. So from me and this little tiny, gorgeous little feather duster, I'll bid you farewell. As always, you're all stars. I love you loads. Take care. And I'll see you on the next edition of Mark's Aquatics, where we could be anywhere. Bye for now.